And our speaker is a marketer with experience across three diverse industries, FMCG, telecom, and automobile. Over his 23 years in sales and marketing, he has worked in leading marketing organizations like Gillette, Procter & Gamble, and Samsung. Building brands, innovating on them, creating new ways of going to market and identifying growth drivers has always been part of his marketing passion. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and help me invite on stage Mr. Sumit Narang, Vice President, Marketing, Bajaj Auto. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll just wait for my presentation to be loaded. And I think somebody has to reset the timer. I can just see time is up already. Okay. Uh, can we have the presentation up, please? Oh, it's coming on the sides. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Once again, guys, uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to all of you out here on a subject which is as vast as perhaps marketing itself. I really don't know how do you summarize uh, brand experience or contain it into a certain part that can be talked about. But I must admit that uh, when I talk about uh, brand experience or when that word comes to my mind as a consumer or as a marketer, somewhere this example always comes up as one of the best practices for me. Kind of you enter that store and you feel young all over again. You somehow feel that those calories are not going to even affect you and you become kind of uh, almost as ravenous as a kid. Uh, several more examples, places which might be some of your favorite uh, uh, joints to hang out, uh, whether you look at uh, places like the PVR, Starbucks, a Hard Rock Cafe, or if you go into some other categories, uh, something from one of our own industry, one of the competitors, uh, Hull Davidson. Uh, if you go to the brand store, great uh, brand experience over there. I think it's more than just motorcycles they've done over there, and my compliments to them. Uh, if you look at the Apple store, again, fantastic experience and a big part of what the brand Apple is all about. So some great uh, uh, industry examples, but one thing we do see in common is that many of these examples that do come to your mind are very often either from the retail industry or from the services industry. So the question is that, is brand experience only limited to that? What about mass market products? What about regular consumer products where you might not have either the luxury or it might not be that critical where brand experience has to really be contained only at the point of sale or the point of consumption? And that brings me to the category which uh, where I'm working currently, and that's automobiles. Don't get me wrong. By no means am I saying that uh, experience at the showrooms, at the dealerships, the service experience is not important. It's extremely important. It's critical. But would a, great, would a great brand experience at the point of sale for an industry like this be enough for a customer to switch his choice? When was the last you walked into a showroom when you had a certain brand in your mind and a car salesman was able to convert you very conclusively, chances are if you were thinking of buying a car and you went to four showrooms, uh, you have probably already decided that these are the two brands I'm going to be considering and these are two backups that I want to look at. So which means that this whole journey of brand experience starts well before you get to that point of sale. So that's a big challenge for certain industries automobiles being one of them. The other big challenge, of course, is that in a category like motorcycles, where you spread all the way from metros to small towns to almost rural, you're talking about a fairly large retail footprint. You're talking about close to about a thousand uh, uh, places that you might be selling out of. And trying to control and maintain a wow brand experience at all of them can be a big challenge. 
So if you're going to talk about brand experience in this context and saying that how does it go beyond point of sale, how does it go beyond the point of consumption, I think it's fair to first put in place a framework. Uh, for me, brand experience is what you feel about a brand. It's more than your brand knowledge. It's more than your brand image. It, I think it goes even beyond your brand positioning. It's a sum total of everything that you have experienced, heard, seen, read about the brand, and by and large, how do you feel about it? So therefore, that to me sums up brand experience. And what you see listed over there are just some of the touch points that many of you would be working with uh, in regular uh, marketing and brand building uh, programs. Very clearly, when you talk about how you feel about a brand, your influence, which is largely on the first two, which is in black, which is advertising and retail, have only a limited role to play in terms of impacting this brand experience. And then there are a whole lot of things. And as Vivek also talked about in his final slide, many of these things are beyond your control, influencers, the chatter, etc. So if I start with a thought that influencing conversations influences brand experiences, and let's keep that as a holding thought as we move ahead in uh, this little piece where I would like to share with you through a few examples on how I believe one can start influencing a brand experience before a guy has really made his choice on what he wants to buy. Because after that, it might give you a very warm feeling, but it's not going to change his brand choice at all. So the example I'm going to take today is going to be one of our brands, uh, Pulsar. Uh, it's a brand that's been around for 15 years, pretty much created a category of sports bikes uh, at a time when the market was all about 100cc uh, commuter bikes. Uh, and it uh, is a huge youth favorite brand. Uh, in fact, it's the market leader in the so-called uh, sports segment. Uh, I'll have to spend the next five minutes uh, orienting a lot of you onto two-wheelers. My, my guess is many of you might have given up riding two-wheelers quite a while back might not be uh, studying that category or using it or looking it up unless those of you who are, uh, you know, uh, wanting to become a, what we call as a born-again rider, uh, that's somebody like me, uh, where you kind of suddenly get into becoming a bike rider again in your mid-40s and the whole world is surprised what is he up to. So let's talk about Pulsar a bit. Uh, it's a huge uh, youth brand in this country. If uh, brands like uh, these is what you thought are really the ones which dominate the sports bike uh, space, you got to really think again. Uh, it's, it actually sells about uh, twice of Yamaha, Suzuki and Honda put together in that segment. So it's that big a brand. Uh, I won't spend too much time talking about the brand, but just to orient you, let me play a couple of ads, recent ones, because somewhere while TV advertising is getting very unfashionable, uh, one good thing is that it's a very good summary of what the brand is all about. So let's look at these two Pulsar ads, just for you to get an idea of what it's about. Let's take a look at one more. Can you play the video, please?
Okay, uh, I can see the slides have got a bit uh, disoriented. But uh, so what you see about the brand, just to keep at the back of your mind, it's like it's like a badass. It's uh, somebody who just thrives on adrenaline, loves to live life on the edge, is all about power, punch, the rush. And that's what Brand Pulsar is all about. Uh, now, more than just that, and more than just being a market leader and a youth brand, it's a very loved brand. Uh, I've had uh, the privilege of working on some great brands, uh, but I haven't worked on any brand that's been loved by its customers as much as the Pulsar has been. And uh, I compare with brands the likes of a Samsung or a Gillette uh, or a Duracell. Uh, there are people who love and worship and they know about the Pulsar brand more than what we do as the marketers of that brand. So that's the kind of uh, customer you are talking about. So now if you want to talk about the brand experience for this kind of a customer, you really can't go the conventional way because he's perhaps more of a brand expert on that than what you possibly are. So when we are talking about brand experience for a product like this, which is a loved brand, then to me, if I was to say that brand experience management, well, all, that's all you can do, you can just manage brand experience, is customer conversation stimulation. If you can stimulate those conversations in the right manner, you are perhaps creating the right kind of brand experiences. Uh, I'm talking about automobiles, but there are several categories where you form a view, even if you've never tried that product out, or you might not even know somebody who's personally using it and has just shared with you what it's all about. And that to me is the complexity of a brand experience. For some of you who are waiting to buy your first Armani suit, perhaps already have a view on it. And it might not be shared by a user. It could well be what you've heard from some experts. It could well be what you've heard on some kind of chatter. When you drive a BMW and you find it much sportier, uh, and you would always believe it's sportier than a Mercedes, which the two brands have been trying to fight out for many years, Certainly, it's not kind of a result of any actual product experience or any rational reason given by any of the users of that product. So that brand experience is going way beyond many things and very difficult to shake that off. Or for that matter, if you are really looking forward to that special day to go to that really expensive restaurant, again, that experience is perhaps based on what you just might have read on a magazine in a flight sometime four months back, and that's one of the destinations you want to go down to. So we're talking about so many of these various chatters around, so many conversations which are influencing what you feel about a brand. And if a brand experience is all about, about what you feel about the brand, then it's important to stimulate those conversations. And that's why I would call it that this customer conversation stimulation is what I see as one of the ways of managing brand experiences. So I'm going to go through a few examples through this framework where I look at four key, call them buckets, call them pillars, call them whatever, but which is going to be, first of all, stimulate an anticipation for your brand, for your product, especially if it's, if it's a passion category or if it's a category people wait for or you've got a new product coming on. So your first task of experience starts before you launch that brand. Second is stimulate around the product. Let people get more excited about the product. We often, as marketers, tend to give the product a secondary role and saying that, you know, brand is everything. Uh, yes, we all are aware that products can be copied, but finally, when it's a rational, when it's a category where uh, people spend a very considered time purchasing it, the product experience per se becomes that important. So how do you stimulate people around a product? Or what I would call as a community stimulation. If you have a brand which has got a community, or it can be formed. And finally, stimulative experiences. Now what we often do in most of our marketing, there could be an ATL, and then we might want to get into doing some activations around a brand. That's just, to my mind, the fourth bucket. 
I think there are opportunities in the first three as well. The other thing which we often end up doing as marketers, and I think that's where we have to think beyond, is if we don't have the luxury of creating a great brand experience at the point of sale or consumption, like the examples I shared uh, in the beginning uh, from the retail or the service industry, we try to create our own brand zone. And we would have those ideas that in the mall, let's do an activation, create a zone where we are celebrating every attribute, every virtue of this brand. Great, but I have yet to see many of these examples being scaled up. And we've got to recognize that influencing experience has to go a lot beyond creating these surrogate retail points which can become your brand zone. So I just want to spend some time talking about these four. Uh, I must warn you, uh, I have loaded this up with a fair number of videos. So the good thing is you're not going to be hearing my voice a hell of a lot. But depending on the time, and I can see the ticker, so we might skip... Uh, a few in case we feel it's taking uh, way too long. So let's kind of look at the first part of stimulating anticipation. I've just taken the example of a brand that we launched last year uh, around April. It's called the RS200. Uh, we actually first exposed uh, this bike uh, in the Auto Expo two years back. And immediately there was a lot of chatter around this particular product because it looked very different. Uh, but when was it going to come? In what format? Nobody knew. And finally, when the time came that we were going to be launching this particular brand, we said, okay, if a big part of uh, this brand has been the anticipation, why don't we just build on that? And this is what I often call as the Harry Potter marketing model, where you almost sell the product even before you launch it. So you build enough anticipation before the launch that you've already, got, you've already created the right kind of perceptions. So which is a perception you create before you launch the product? I think that's one area where a lot of different categories can also take a, a leaf out of. Uh, I'll just share with you a little uh, teaser with you, just again to encapsulate our thinking, which we put out, uh, which didn't show the product, but kind of uh, stimulated the anticipation. Let's take a look at this video, please. So the first stimulation that we created was we exposed the name. And everybody's thinking there's a lot of online chatter which happened on uh, what does uh, RS stand for. And this thing pretty much just, uh, you know, put the market on fire. Now, thankfully for us, it's a passion category, so people are actively searching. Thankfully for us, there is a whole auto uh, uh, media which uh, looks forward to new launches and what's new and, uh, you know, what are the new scoops per se. So conversations around what the brand is, uh, as if you are able to read some of the comments over here, guys saying, wow, what a great bike. Somebody commenting, but they didn't even show the bike. So what do you mean by what a great bike? And that's what I think stimulating some of these senses is all about, where uh, you just do a little tease, show a little bit, but keep the rest for later. I think uh, we very often tend to downplay the product, as I mentioned a while back. And... To me, romancing the product and putting it on everybody's to-do list is something which has to start from the marketer. If you feel excited about it, your customers will feel excited about it. I find the automobile industry does it pretty well. I find the food industry, again, does it extremely well. It's got to get onto the guy's list that I want to see this particular product next weekend. This is my task for the weekend. So, and that's where, uh, and I'll skip this video, is where there was a nice reveal romancing video about this product, talking about the features. Uh, something interesting over here is the timing for these kind of uh, 
you know, uh, initiatives from your side. If I do this today, it will be a super flop. But if you do it on the day of launch, and that's what we did, we did it exactly on the day of launch, it goes live, it suddenly virals because that's when it's hot news. After three days, it was no good. And that's where we could see the component of organic to our uh, video views pretty much came down when we tried to play it again after about two weeks. So that's, again, to my mind, a part of stimulating anticipation to build overall stimulating conversations. And something like what, you know, thankfully today there are enough measures that you can really see that have you been able to strike a chord with your customers or not? Uh, if a guy is searching, clearly he's interested. So today, I mean, to my mind, if you're really able to see your analytics well, it pretty much tells you a lot more than what a brand track would. Because this is actual behavior, everything else is really claimed. What you see as a blip over there is the kind of uh, searches it got. And I've just put some other brands over there. Just picked up some popular automobile brands just for you to get some kind of uh, comparison on the kind of blip uh, the brand got on the day of launch. So that's the kind of anticipation you can build around it. I think the second uh, stimulation is all around the product. And you've got to excite people about the product. Uh, and that's been one of my learnings when I moved from FMCG into categories like, uh, like uh, telecom and automobile. You can build a great brand, you can talk everything about the brand, but if the product is just not gelling with people, there is really nothing you can do about it. If you've seen, and I'm sure there are case studies written and many more will be written about, for example, an example like a Nokia. Great brand, uh, number one, number two on the trusted list. But if the whole product strategy just doesn't go right, there's, there's little you can do about it. And same holds true even for our category. Now, the interesting thing over here is that people don't believe you. And therefore, you've got to communicate your message through others who would be more credible, at least in their eyes. And that's, again, a little channel you can use to stimulate around the product. So, for example, I mean, the visuals you see over here are automobile experts, uh, people who are worshipped as real experts on knowing what an automobile is. And we've all seen all these auto uh, journals and journals uh, and blogs around. So pretty much uh, these are influencers for our customers and holding a session with them, uh, giving them the bike to ride on the track, giving them a full day with the bike and then capturing their experiences becomes a great piece of content to once again influence what people are going to feel about the brand. So let's just see a part of this video just for you to uh, get a feel of it. At the end of the straight, it showed an indicated speed of 150 kilometers an hour. This is far more than what we have ever achieved on any other pulse until date. It definitely feels faster than the other pulses. 151, 152 kilometers per hour at the back straight here at Chakrat. It is, it is, it is. Definitely the fastest pulser. You can push, you can lean harder and harder until you run out of... Uh, Guts. This bike is built to live. It's a lively machine which is an extension of yourself. It's like a proper new age pulsar. All right, let's just pause it and move on. It's definitely the most an evolved and there's a clear vision yeah, can you where the bike it? is heading and the brand is heading. You can see the evolution of the pulsar range over the past. Sorry, I'll just uh, skip the rest. You do get an idea in the interest of time. So I think getting experts to talk about your product, endorse your products, and how you socialize it amongst your customers is a great part of stimulating uh, your customers around the product. The other part is something like your feature dramatization. Uh, and how can you make it very convincingly? Because if people believe in those attributes, they'll believe in the product. Let's take a look at this video, which is all about uh, uh, one attribute about this bike was it was one of the very, very few in the market which came up with an ABS braking system. Now, most people don't have much of an idea about what ABS brakes are and what do they do. We all know that it's a superior form of braking. 
and so was the case with our customers. Which meant that if we went on and talked about that, oh, this has got ABS, so that's better safety, that's just about a one-line expression. But if I could change their perception and their knowledge base about what ABS is, not are they going to love the bike more, they would also love me more for making them a little more educated about the product. So let's take a look at this video on the ABS dramatization. The new Bajaj Pulsar RS200 comes with an optional ABS, that is, anti-lock braking system. The ABS is an extremely important feature in a super sports bike. This video demonstrates the braking performance of RS200, which comes with ABS compared to other sports bikes without ABS. These tests attempt to replicate extreme braking conditions in real-life scenarios. Braking on gravel has always been tough. Let's test it on extreme gravel surface, as seen here with sand and mud. Let's first see how the bike behaves without ABS. As seen here, the front brakes have locked up the wheel and hence the bike has lost traction and gone out of control. Pulsar RS200 with ABS prevents the wheel from locking up and giving complete control to the rider. Now let's see how the bike behaves on wet slippery conditions. And what can be more slippery than a tarpaulin with lots of water sprayed on it? On the Pulsar RS200 with ABS, the rider is in complete control and has also reduced stopping distance. The best feature on the RS200 would undoubtedly be the ABS. It's so very progressive, linear in its bike, grab everything. The front wheel is going to prevent riders from locking up, say while entering the corners or under panic braking. Experience the ultimate speed and control on the Pulsar RS200, which comes with ABS. Not doctored, a uh, genuine video. This is what you would have normally wanted to give a brand experience. You would want to do about a thousand of these zones and let people experience it themselves. Obviously, uh, there are practical issues. But that's where creating something that's totally genuine, not doctored, and then socializing becomes a great way of stimulating conversations around the product. I'll skip the video of the third one, but another part of your product stimulation is where you build an evidence for performance. And again, you use somebody outside your brand. And in this case, what we did was uh, we uh, tied up with uh, Overdrive and uh, we created this little event where this young rider, he rode what they call, what in the biking world is called as a saddle sore challenge. Saddle sore is where you ride 1600 kilometers in 24 hours. So that's 24 hours of non-stop. So this guy starts from Pune, went till Hyderabad, turned around, came back. And that's the kind of uh, journey he achieved. Uh, and the film was all about capturing his experience and not, because not every bike can hold up to such a long kind of a distance. So that's again creating this kind of stuff which would stimulate people around the product. Now this is where I think uh, many of you might be thinking that is it, how is it different from normal 360 marketing that we might be doing or the holistic marketing we're doing. Maybe not very much but there's one thin line of, uh, one thin dividing line. Uh, I think if there is a purpose and if you are mounting a different experience which would stimulate something, then yes, I think it's stimulating brand experience as well. Otherwise, likely it just might be getting into a lot of activism or it just might be getting into multiple touch points, same message. So a little thin dividing line over here. Oh. The third part is, I mean, today we are living in an era where Communities are being formed around brands. In some categories, they could be very visible. In some categories, they might not be very visible and identified. But there's a lot of task required in identifying your communities. So when we uh, moved out, we realized that over the last two, three years, uh, biking, riding groups have been coming up uh, across the country. Uh, biking as a weekend passion activity is growing not only in the large cities, but even going down to smaller towns. So it's a question of identifying those groups, forming some kind of an equation with them, so that now you at least have visibility to their chatter, 
or at least or in, in, in a better scenario, you can influence it. Now, many of these uh, uh, people who are part of these so-called uh, brand fans, brand passionates, riding groups, etc., these are, these are like the local experts. The last time you thought of buying a car, chances are you might have spoken with somebody in your friend circle who you know is knowledgeable about cars. And some of what he would have said, if he said something about the ground clearance of that car, I mean, that was enough for you. You didn't want to even see the, what the data said. For you, that was all important. And that's the kind of uh, influence some of these guys can play. So I believe these guys are great assistant brand managers. So you must delegate a whole lot of your marketing to your brand community if you can stimulate them. And that's what uh, we've uh, tried doing. So, uh, for example, uh, you create experiences for them. So, for example, with our brand, we started promoting a lot of breakfast rides, which they were anyways doing, and then we added some more, uh, you know, some more glamour and some more uh, services to that. So now they're going on an official Pulsar breakfast ride. So those are the kind of uh, things that we could bring it to them. You provide them content that they could share and then forward it within their community. Uh, sorry. You treat them well. Uh, there is another brand we relaunched uh, sometime back. We did a refresh uh, sometime in November called Avenger. Avenger is a cruiser. It's again quite a cult brand. And we launched it in, an, in a very different way. We said, why should we launch it? It should be launched by the users of this brand. So we, and we were launching a refresh uh, so we, we invited the riders, the passionate riders of Avenger to a place which was through about a 100 kilometer ride. So people from Pune and Mumbai went to Lonavla and we did a kind of an event for them over there and they unveiled the bike. And we did this across some 8-10 cities across the country. And suddenly what did you have? You had people who were actual users of this product for last few years suddenly give you a thumbs up on the refresh. Otherwise sometimes current users might be the ones who are most... Uh, cynical about a refresh, saying that I think my version was much better. And it, what that helped create was fantastic experience for a lot of people. I think what you need to also create is if you have a community, you got to create content that they would not only like to consume, but even like to share. So we said, what can we create for people who are into riding? One thing what we often keep creating are little posts, little videos, which is all around the biking thing, and they would very happily share with each other. But we said if you want to make something more meaningful and if you believe that riding is growing as an activity, not everybody is an expert rider and not everybody understands the rules of riding in a group, but they might be aspiring to do that. So we created a little content video which was about the riding language. So you know when you ride in a group, uh, obviously it's about 30 riders going and if some of you who are into riding, there's riding language of how there's a signal on how do you speed up, how do you stop, go onto a single lane, make a two lane. So accordingly, there are, there's a language which riders follow. And he said people would love to have this kind of language democratized, brought to everybody through Pulsar. So let's take a look at this video, which is all about content for the community, but in the form of creating a language for them. Let's see this video, please.
consistency which kind of would have to cut through all pieces of content, experiences, etc., is that badass attitude of the brand. So even if you are talking over here a language of discipline, which is what writing language is all about, and it kind of you know contradicts what the brand is all about, somewhere you know it's like discipline the way a badass would teach his friends. So obviously the the brand essence kind of pretty much has to see its way through all touch points. Uh, finally, I come to the fourth one, which is uh, stimulative experiences, and that's what we often you know call as the activations around the brand. And I think uh, if you can find uh, some ways of entertaining your customers, there's nothing like it because nobody wants to ever come and attend an activation which is all about giving you a lecture on that brand or creating some kind of an educative environment when he's out. Nobody really wants to do that. But I think if you can entertain the guys and while entertaining them, show performance and attributes of your product, I think it's a great win-win. So something over here, what you see is uh, what uh, we've uh, been uh, doing a bit is what we call as a pulsar mania. It's a, it's a module which has got biking performance, stunt shows, etc. And we take it from town to town. Uh, what we figured out after doing the first round was that it, it was received well in the cities, but in the smaller towns, and I'm talking about towns of population about three to five lakhs and even smaller, it was a huge hit because that was probably one of the biggest entertainment uh, event which happened there in the last several months. So that is another big opportunity. Uh, I'll just uh, show you a little video which just shows you over here again on how, uh, maybe I'll just skip it in the interest of time. Uh, but that's, it's a traveling uh, stunt show because uh, the brand has taken uh, stunts as a measure of demonstrating performance. Uh, and therefore, if this is what you're talking about in your advertising, uh, there's no reason why that should also not be the format which you would want to demonstrate to people live. And if it's, if it's entertaining on the screen, it's equally entertaining on the ground. So let's skip it in the interest of time uh, right now. Uh, another one, another example I, I, I picked up could again be and another way in which you can experience brand in everyday life is if you can somehow become, I would just call it become the daily lingo. Uh, somewhere enter the mainstream conversations, even if they're not talking about your product. So uh, what we created, for example, was a little app through which people could send messages to each other. And those messages would be in the form of a burnout. Burnout is when you see the rear wheel uh, spinning and it kind of uh, creates lines and all. That's what we call as a burnout. So let's just see this uh, video. Uh, it's a short one. And uh, uh, then I'll just talk for about 30 seconds after this. So can we have this video, please? assume this is a message that you want to be converted into a burnout message. So this is a message that the customer types in. See the 
So it's so you know so every alphabet was kind of created. And now imagine if you want to wish your biker friend a happy birthday, and uh, let's say with his name, let's say Anand, and you say happy birthday Anand, and he gets a message like this, which is a burnout message saying happy birthday Anand. I mean, if that's not a brand experience, then I wonder what it would be. So uh, that's another way of creating a stimulative experience for which the customer need not necessarily have to go out somewhere, but he can pretty much feel every aspect of the brand. So that's where I think we got to look at avenues where you can become a part of their lingo. So that's pretty much from my side. So if I just sum up, I think uh, some of the key messages uh, I have over here on this uh, subject is, uh, I believe very simplistically, brand experience is how you feel about a brand. And you can't really achieve it through a one-way conversation. You can't really doctor it completely. There's a whole lot of uh, uncontrolled, unaudited, uh, conversations happening around uh, and you have to therefore take brand experience beyond the point of sale or the point of consumption. Uh, it might be too late for certain categories to have a great brand experience at the point of sale because the guy's already formed a view even before he's reached over there. And forming that uh, view before he reaches that point of sale is where I believe stimulating customer conversations is perhaps one of uh, the more fertile routes which at least I have come across in recent times. Uh, we stimulate customer conversations is one way in which we also impact brand perception uh, and therefore uh, you know, business, sales and equity. So that's it from my side, guys. Uh, thank you very much. You've been a great, patient audience. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Narang. That was truly an interesting session. And to give away the memento to you, I'd like to invite on stage Mr. Suresh Balakrishna, CEO, South Asia and Middle East Kinetic. There you are. All right, ladies and gentlemen, time to put your hands together for Mr. Nara. Thank you so much, sir, for being here and for sharing those amazing... Well, Suresh has been one of uh, the key partners on this journey. So it's actually unfair taking a memento from him. Really <laughs> speaking, uh, you should be taking it as much as I am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sirs, for joining us. Thank you.